When I read this passage, I have to ask myself, what in the world set off James to write what he wrote? Why is he so dramatic in his comments about the tongue? I wonder if he had a fight with his wife before he wrote this, or if um, he had a political argument with somebody, or whether he just got out of a church meeting. Wherever it is, he's riled up. As he says himself, the tongue sets on fire the cycle of nature. When I was a young boy, my mother used to say to me from time to time, watch your tongue. And she usually met one of two things when she said that. One was that I had said something that was disrespectful or that I had used bad language. And to pony on John's comments this morning, uh, that threat to wash out the mouth with soap was always there. And that image from the movie A Christmas Story with the little boy sitting there with the bar of life boy in his mouth uh, is a vivid reminder of those threats. In the house in which I grew up, violating Exodus 20, verse 7, was the worst thing you could possibly do. 20, verse 7 says, The Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. As James tells us in verse 6, the tongue sets on fire the cycle of nature and is itself set on fire by hell. Anger is set on fire by the tongue. Disrespect is set on fire by the tongue. Vulgarity is set on fire by the tongue. Watch your tongue is an admonition our society needs to heed because we live in a time when vulgarity pervades our environment at the most unexpected moments and seems to permeate our culture. The forbidden and shocking seven dirty words of Lenny Bruce have become so commonplace that they don't shock anymore, they just annoy and disgust. A Supreme Court justice once said in relation to pornography, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. The problem for our culture is that it no longer knows vulgarity when it sees it because norms have shifted so far and slipped slow, so low. And so we've come to a situation where one hears from the mouths of children words that my mother would describe as, quote, swearing like a sailor. And no one no insult intended to any of you who happen to serve in the Navy. The point is we've stepped on a slippery slope and we have slid a long way. I think we have come to this situation in part because we take words too lightly. As children, we used to respond to taunts with sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. But if you were taunted, you know that words hurt. Words indeed do hurt. Words are important, and we need to take them seriously. In the New Testament, something really amazing is said about words. There's an amazing claim that words are related to our salvation or our damnation. In the New Testament, people hear the preaching and they are saved. Vibrations are sent out in the air, they strike the eardrums of another, and hearts are changed. Jesus is the Word. There's a warning for teachers in this passage that words can lead to condemnation. Words are important because they reflect the heart. Remember that passage from Mark 7 we studied a couple of weeks ago? where Jesus said there's nothing outside a person that can defile a person, but the things which come out of a person are what defile a person. Or Romans chapter 10, where we read, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he has, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Words are important. We need to take them seriously. They're related to our actions. Even pagan philosophers recognize that relationship. 
Musonius Rufus, who was a Stoic philosopher, sometimes referred to as the Roman Socrates, once wrote, one begins to lose his hesitation to do unseemly things when one loses his hesitation to speak of them. Now, 2,000 years ago, a pagan philosopher recognized accurately the situation. He was much more accurate than we would like to admit sometimes. The discussion in James of bits in horses' mouths and rudders stealing sh steering ships are words we need to hear and heed and his warning that the tongue is a restless evil. Words are important. They can hurt and they can heal. Words can wound and they can hurt others. Someone once wrote that the difference between a successful marriage and a mediocre one consists of leaving about three things said, unsaid every day. There are times when we need to hold our tongue. Words can be aggressive. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of Winston Churchill and his quick wit, but his words were often very aggressive. He often engaged in verbal combat with Lady Astor, who was an American-born uh, member of parliament, the first woman member of parliament, and she was also a teetotaler. And at a party once, Lady Astor said, Mr. Churchill, you are drunk, to which he responded, and you, madam, are ugly but in the morning I'll be sober. <laughs> now, while that is cute, one of the things we need to begin to appreciate is that that, that that speech is aggressive, that sarcasm is always aggressive. I once served a congregation where there was a mean spirit in the congregation and sarcasm pervaded the discussions in meetings and people got on each other's case. And I came to the conclusion that the reason was that there was an issue in the congregation that had never been resolved and the hostility in the congregation just get, kept getting passed around in sarcastic humor. Aggressive behavior is sometimes expressed with our words. James says, the tire, it sets on fire the cycle of nature and is itself set on fire by hell. And so uh, reflect on yourself. Are you aggressive in the way in which you use words? Because words are important. But they can also heal as well as hurt. The words, I'm sorry, do you know that they're said uh, this has been studied, they're said about three times as often in marriages that are successful as they are in marriages that are not successful. The words, I'm sorry. And the words, I forgive you, when truly meant, can be a tremendous healing force. He talks in this passage about words that curse and words that bless, and one of the things Christians need to be aware of is the power we have to bless others with the words we use to encourage them and heal them and express love to them. One of the things that Stephen ministers learn in their training is how to use words of blessing because receiving a blessing is a very powerful experience. Words can encourage. Uh, many years ago, there was a popular little book on uh, management called the One Minute Manager. And the gist of the book was that managers needed to find, to catch their employees doing something right and then encourage them in that behavior. And that was much more effective in producing the kind of culture that you wanted than complaining whenever something went wrong. Words can hurt, but words can heal. Sometime when you've got a minute and you're reading Galatians, in chapter 5, beginning at verse 19, are a list of fruits of the Spirit and works of the flesh. It's a list of virtues and vices for Christians. But I want you to think sometime as you're reflecting on this, how many of those virtues and how many of those vices are related to the way we use words? Words are important because they can hurt and they can heal.
Now, what is behind the words we speak? Where do they come from? What's their origin? James points out that the blessings and the cursings come from the same tongue. And he uses the image of a spring. Behind the words is a spring, the source that those blessings or those curses come from, and that source is the heart. The tongue and the heart are very closely related. The key issue really is what the state of our heart is. To tame the tongue, we must work on the heart. If the heart's not right, the tongue will bloom. As James says, a fig tree can't produce olives and a grapevine can't produce figs. An angry heart produces aggressive words. A selfish heart produces manipulative words. A resentful heart produces hurtful words. But by the same token, a peaceful heart produces words that lead to peace in others. And a loving heart produces words that encourage others. And a humble heart produces words that glorify God. James points out that a salt water spring can't produce fresh water, and a heart that's not right cannot produce words that are right. So ask yourself, what's the state of your heart? Really all the evidence you need to make that evaluation is the words that you speak. The ones you speak out loud are the ones that you retain as your own thoughts. What is the state of your heart? To tame the tongue, we must work on the heart. Now, verse 8 of our passage today seems to be a very pessimistic word. No human being can tame the tongue. No human being can tame the tongue. That seems pessimistic unless you forget another word of Jesus when he said in Mark 10, with human beings it is impossible but not with God, for all things are possible with God. So you see, we wind up right back where we always wind up. Our power is not sufficient, and God's power is never insufficient. This is the place where people of faith always arrive, our dependence upon the grace of God. And so watch your tongue. The tongue can be tamed by healing the heart, and the heart can be healed by the grace of God. Amen.